Hi, and welcome to my Floss Tube channel. I'm Jean Farish, and I'm glad that you're here with me today. We're going to start out with a couple of updates, and then I have a brand new tutorial, this one on the Nun Stitch, which is the perfect edging for bookmarks, sachets, ornaments, and needlebook pages. So we'll get into that after a couple of announcements. But first, about that public subscriber thing that I talked about last week. Just forget it. What I've discovered is that YouTube does not make it easy for you or for me to figure out who a subscriber is and whether or not your subscriptions are public or not. So I am just scrapping that whole idea of um, qualifying a, a prize winner by saying that they have to be a subscriber and I have to be able to see it. So what I decided to do in all fairness was to actually give two January prizes. Now remember, I didn't do one in the month of January because I hadn't figured this all out. And then last week I announced that I would do the January drawing this week and the February drawing in a couple of weeks. So that's where we are. This is for the January drawing. And so I decided I would give two um, $25 gift certificates to my Etsy store. One to somebody who I could see that they were a public subscriber and one to an unknown as far as not knowing whether or not they're a subscriber or not. So those two winners are Claire O and Janice Bean. And I've already left messages for them or comments on their comment to me uh, that had the word celebrate in it. And um, I'll also put it in the um, episode description for this episode. And as well, an announcing it here. So it's three ways I'm, I'm reaching out to these two um, viewers and in hopes that they will um, get back to me in the next week. And if I don't hear from them, then I'll, I'll choose somebody else. So that's, that's all I can say about that after having that big long explanation last week about uh, how you can go in and see whether or not you're a public subscriber. And anyway, I, I'm learning. I, it does disappoint me that YouTube makes it so difficult for both parties, for you and for me, to figure out whether or not a person is a subscriber or not. So, but, you know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, that, that's all I'm going to say about that. So, um, let's talk about the Jane Hattersley Stitch Along that starts on April 9th, um, which is coming up fast. Um, what I wanted to talk about today is the designations I used for that sampler. I talk about the traditional and the classic. So, um, for many of you, this will be a review, and for some of you, it may be new news. Anyway, so like like most people who reproduce antique samplers, I strive to make it as authentic as possible. Sometimes some of the things that, that go on in trying to transcribe an, an antique just, you know, it, 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 it is very, very difficult to make an exact replica. Things like um, mistakes where the, the young stitcher may have stitched um, accidentally over three or um, just general miscountings like that. And then there are um, cases where the stitches have disintegrated and it takes a little bit of detective work to figure out um, what the original did look like. But so that's what I'm calling the traditional um, sampler for Jane Hattersley. And that is one that, in terms of the chart, is pretty much exactly the way it was uh, stitched by Jane. <clears throat> also, while I'm thinking about it, last week I misspoke and, and identified the fabric that the traditional one was stitched on incorrectly. It was actually stitched on pecan shortbread, 
which is a legacy linen from Access Commodities. So that's the traditional, and that's the one that was stitched by my, my daughter, Elizabeth, and it's on the, the, the cover of, of the chart. But then in maybe uh, an exuberant dose of creativity, whatever, I decided that I wanted to lighten and brighten the colors and stitch it on um, kind of just a, a soft white linen and so I did, and dubbed that one the classic. Now, in terms of fabric, you can take that traditional chart and stitch it on many different fabric types. And remember, because this one's done completely in cross-stitch, it can be done on Aida as well. So it can be done on linen, even weave, or Aida. And the participating shops are doing a great job of... Um, pulling together um, an assortment of fabrics so that everybody, I, I, I feel like that everybody can find exactly what what's in their comfort zone. So, but you can also take what I'm gonna describe just now as the classic and still stitch it on the darker fabric if, if you want to, um, and with the same colors that, that Jane used. So when I stitched the classic, I used, um, I just kind of brightened up the colors a little bit and I substituted kind of a tawny color for one of the grays. So there is, it's not, it's not a real extreme um, difference in, in the colors. It's, it's much more subtle. But the biggest thing I think is that I decided that I would try to fix some of Jane's mistakes. And that's, um, you know, this is just personal taste. Some people, you know, want to do it um, exactly like the original. And, and obviously that's fine. I mean, I charted it that way. But if you've ever had a hankering just to kind of straighten things out a little bit, this might be the chance to do it with me because that's, that's what I've done here. The most extreme change that I made is right here in this flower motif. It kind of bothered me how haphazard it was stitched in the original. And so I just sort of cleaned it up a little bit. And here's how that same motif is stitched in the original. And you can see where it just seems like that Jane kind of like went a little bit bonkers up, up there. So I don't know. Again, it just, it's a matter of, um, of personal taste. And this is how that same motif looks on the one that um, my daughter Elizabeth stitched. Another area that I changed was in this crown. You can see where it's stitched. Um, let me come in closer. You can see where it's stitched in two colors. And I dropped the second color and stitched it just with one so that It looks like this. So again, these changes are not um, extreme and it's just purely a matter of stitcher's choice. So uh, I just wanted to chat about that just a little bit because there've been a lot of questions about traditional, classic, etc. And, you know, maybe I overcomplicated things in an effort to give you choices, but it is what it is. There's not a whole lot to say about Roxy, except for the fact that we are right on time to start on March 1st. I mean, I've been saying that all along, but I didn't really believe it would happen. But it looks like we're going to be able to start on our target date. Uh, Elizabeth has cut all the fabric and she cut it right on the linen lines, just like her mama taught her. And I zigzagged all the edges and um, the floss arrived and I was, um, I mean, I knew how much floss I ordered, but somehow when you see it in this box and uh, upon uh, a little investigation realized that it's four layers deep. And yes, several people said it looks like a whole bunch of chocolate bars, but you know what? Roxy floss is better than chocolate, I think. Close tie maybe, but Right now, I'm more excited about floss than I am about chocolate. So I uh, unloaded it and got it all organized by number and checked it all in and 
we're we're good to go so that's um that's pretty much gonna fill our next couple of days is packing kits and getting the orders out and you know it's not too late to join us um the charts will be sent by email um there'll be pdf uh, charts uh, along with a, a link to video tutorials for each one of the six parts. So it's not too late to, to order that, that option of the chart plus video links. And, you know, really any creamy sort of linen um, will work. I, I, I have, again, made accommodations for Aida. It's, it's not, um, you know, I want to warmly urge you to try linen or even weave if you're ready. But if not, it, it can be done on Aida. And um, although some people are finding it hard to, to get the Cosmo floss and, you know, we, we waited for our order to come in. But um, I do give the numbers for the DMC equivalent. So if you've got a nice piece of creamy linen and you've got access to DMC floss, there's really no reason why you can't join us um, March 1st. So remember when you go to my Etsy store to buy the P PDF set of charts, um, you won't really be able to download a chart right then. Uh, I'll be emailing those to you. So make sure that I've got a good email address for you. And that's, that's really about all about Roxy that I can share right now. It's it's hard because it's a mystery. And so, uh, you know, I, I want to show you images and I, I, I can't, not until March 1st. So that brings us to a tutorial that's kind of been on my to-do list for a while, and that's the Nun Stitch. This is one of the projects that I um, designed and taught on one of our cruises. This one was uh, in 2018, and we went to all these fabulous um, cities in Northern Europe. And this stitcher's um, case that I made featured the nun stitch on the edges of the needle book that's part of it. So that's what I want to show you how to do today, and that's the nun stitch. And we're going to start by talking um, just a little bit about why it's called that. And this story goes back to Ginny Thompson, who is just um, a legend in the needlework industry. I, I have often said that if each person identified who taught them how to do cross stitch, and then that person identified who taught them how to do cross stitch. In other words, if you kind of did almost like a family tree genealogy sort of thing, tracing the roots back to where people learned to do cross stitch, I would say that most Americans in this century anyway, well, and last century as well, well, like since the 70s, that most stitchers actually learned from Jenny Thompson. She um, often traveled um, and learned to do cross stitch, and learned to do the Danish method and came back home and taught people at her shop called The Counting House uh, in Pauley's Island, South Carolina, and um, just began teaching people this, this revival craft of doing counted cross stitch. So one day in class when she was teaching the open-sided edging stitch, she explained to her students that this was often done by nuns who made um, and did incredible handwork. And they actually did this in the seam allowance of fine clothing that they then sold to make money for their order and um, became well known for their craftsmanship and their attention to detail. So in telling the story and teaching the stitch, after a few moments, one of her students said, wait a minute, I have a question about that stitch that, that and couldn't remember the name of it, and said, you know, that nun stitch. And that, that nickname stuck. And um, so to this day, um, most Americans refer to it as the nun stitch. What is incredible about the stitch is that it's simple, it's sturdy and it prevents raveling. So as I said uh, at the beginning of this episode, it's ideal for finishing the edges of bookmarks or ornaments or anything that you want to um, 
have a finished edge without turning it under or protecting it in, in any other way. So let me show you how this stitch is done. I stitched a duplicate page to give you a real life example of the stitch rather than just telling you the theory or doing it in the abstract. The chart for this particular design tells me that I want to have four linen threads or two squares, um, two Aida stitches away from the design to the um, backbone of my nun stitch. So I've basted those lines and I went on and counted up and basted where the top of it's gonna be as well. This step will just really um, save me time and help me um, kind of just enjoy the stitch. It's a very rhythmic and relaxing stitch. And if I had to stop each time I came to a corner and count to see if I was in the right place to turn, it would kind of take something away from that. So I think in the long run that it's actually a, a time saver. We're gonna stitch this with a single strand of number 12 pearl cotton, which comes on a ball like this. And um, I can see that it's a number 12 is kind of tucked over here. That tell, that's the weight of the thread. And pearl cotton is not, um, it's not a divisible thread and it's not one that you double up and stitch with, with two strands, for example. If the weight of number 12 is not heavy enough for what you want, then you would go up to the next weight, which is number eight. So I'm gonna just set that aside and get started. I've put a knot in the end of my thread and I'm working with about a 16 inch um, length of thread here. I'm gonna plant my um, waist knot right along here. This is where my stitches are gonna end. And so I'm gonna be burying this um, beginning thread as I finish the last section. My first stitch is going to be in this corner and we're going to work down to this corner. Let's take a look at the diagram. Now I'm going to put a diagram like this on my um, blog so that you will have it to, uh, to refer to. But each stitch is going over two linen threads. If you're working on Aida, that would be one square. And you can see that in this space, I've actually got two stitches. So I'm working from left to right and then left to right again. Then I'm going to drop down two linen threads and again make two stitches. Now I have lined these up very neatly on the diagram, but don't worry about which one is on the top or the bottom. Just try to get them so they're side by side and not on top of each other. Once I finish stitch four, I'm going to come across on the diagonal and repeat again left to right, left to right and then bottom to top, bottom to top. It's important to note that whatever stitched area you have is gonna to be to the right of the nun stitch as we're working it. So I've buried my tail right here. Here's my first corner. And I'm gonna move over two linen threads to the left. Now at this point, I don't need my basting threads anymore and they're gonna kinda of just be in the way. So I'm gonna get rid of some of them. I'm going to poke and pull the stitch to start with, and then I'm going to show you how I do it in a sewing motion. So working left to right, I'm going over two linen threads. And then I'm taking a second stitch in those exact same holes. So again, going left to right. From there, I'm going to drop down two linen threads. And I'm sharing a hole with that first stitch. And taking a second stitch in the same two holes. So 
So now I'm going to show you the same two stitches doing it in a sewing motion. So I'm beginning in the same spot. I'm going to work the stitch left to right. So I'm going to scoop up those same two threads. And now I'm going to go in the shared hole and come down two threads. Go in that same shared hole and come out in the same shared hole. I'm going to finish the stitch, which gives me the second stitch in the same um, in the same channel. But now notice that my needle is on the diagonal pointed down. So it's the beginning of the stitch, the horizontal stitch. And this scooping motion finishes that stitch and puts me in the position to start the second stitch in the same place. And now my needle is pointing down. So that finishes that first stitch and puts my needle in the position for the next stitch. Now I'm going to finish that stitch and put my needle on the diagonal, which puts me in the place for my next stitch. So now let me just show you how, how that rhythm works. So pointing down. Pointing down. Diagonal. Sideways. Down. And you just continue with that same rhythm. Now I'm going to pause here and take this um, rest of this basting thread out because I don't really need this anymore. The important thing is that this basting line is going to be my stop sign to know when to uh, turn my corner. As I've come to the end of the usual part of my pearl cotton, it's time to talk about how to end a thread and start the next one. Traditionally, we bury our thread under stitches that we have already done. But when you're doing a pulled thread stitch, which is what this is, you really want to carry your thread forward in the direction it would have gone in if you had an infinite amount of thread. So I'm going to put this in the hole where it would have gone. And then on the back, I'm carrying the thread where it would have um, gone. So I'm going to simply um, anchor it over here. And I'm just doing a, a couple little stitches. I'm not going to put a knot or anything because it's going to get buried fairly quickly. I threaded my needle with the next length of pearl cotton. And now I am going to bury it under my existing stitches. Now these stitches are tiny and they're tight. So take your time working your needle under them. Got one more right here. Because again, the theory is that I'm starting my new thread and I'm carrying it from the direction those stitches would have come in. So now my next stitch is an upright stitch. So it's not going to catch my... Um, 
ending thread. And I'm taking my time with this because I don't want to pull out the stitches that I've just put in. So I'm not going to pull it too tightly until I get it good and anchored. So that was the first stitch of the two. And now there's the second stitch. Now the horizontal stitches are the ones that on the back will catch my traveling thread. So there's the first of the two horizontal stitches. And now the second one. I'm gonna sew here for a minute because again, my Vertical thread is not going to catch, my vertical stitch is not going to catch that thread on the back. But when I take this diagonal stitch over this way, it should catch it on the back. And let's, we'll see if it did. Yes. I think that's anchored it well enough. So now I'm going to clip off. This is my, this is the tail from the first thread. So I'm gonna tug on it so it's nice and tight and clip this off what I call dangerously close. There's no sense in leaving any excess. And this is the beginning of the thread that's currently in my needle. So again, I'm pulling it nice and tight and cutting it off close. And now since I'm close to being on the corner, let me show you how you turn the corner. So let's see what I have here. I have one stitch there. So now it's time for the diagonal needle motion. Stitch my two horizontal stitches. And once again, my basting thread is kind of in the way. So I'm gonna get my needle in the right place. And then I'm gonna cut some of this basting thread away. So what I call the backbone of my stitch when I turn the corner is going to be in this channel right here. So I'm going to do one more stitch this way. So that's one. And now I'm going to finish that stitch and turn the corner. I'm going to do my sideways stitch. And start my upright stitch.
Before I go any further, I just want to confirm that I'm in the right place. So this row is going to be right lined up with my basting thread. So that's the right place. I'm getting ready to start my next thread. Before I do, I want to show you the difference between a fresh thread and the end of a work thread. So this is the thread that I just finished, and this is the new one. If you let me put it against the dark background, I think you'll be able to see it better. I'm pointing this out to tell you that this is why you don't want to work with a really long piece of pearl cotton with pulled thread work. Because as you're pulling this thread through the linen, there's a lot of wear and tear on it. And you can see the difference in the texture between a fresh thread and the end of a used thread. Now I'm back to the beginning. And this is that knot that I put in at the very um, start of the, of the project. So I need to get rid of that. So I'm gonna clip that off very carefully. I think the safest thing to do is to turn it over and uh, cut it like this. Get rid of the knot. And now I can take another couple of stitches and with this last stitch right here, I think I can, yes, I just accidentally caught it, so that's good. It would have been better if I had left that original tail a little bit longer than I did. Would have made this last step a little bit easier. Make sure I'm still catching it. And that's it. Now, remember that um, to continue with this concept, if I, to bury this thread, I would take it in the direction it would have gone in if I had more, um, kind of if the thread was an infinite amount. So I'm gonna actually end this last thread by tunneling under these stitches right here. You know, I don't have much to pull on right here. Again, I would have been wise to have left this to been more like two or three inches long instead of just this little inch that I have. Oops. And that's it for the stitching. So the next part is trimming the linen right up against these stitches. And this is where I do recommend that you um, clip a thread. Now I'm going to make it easier on myself by cutting away um, where I zigzagged it first. And that'll make it easier to pull this thread out right here.
Okay, now the last step is trimming away the excess. You want to trim this so that it's as close as possible to your stitching without cutting your stitching. And that is it for the nun stitch. I think you're going to find that the nun stitch is a real workhorse of a stitch and one that you'll find many applications for. If not in the very near future, then at some point in time when you come across it, you're going to say, oh, I know how to do that stitch. So thanks once again for joining me this week. I will see you next week and between now and then. Stitch happy and stay safe.